Hi, I'm PJ Kwong for SGS Live, and in today's session, we're going to take a look at a story that shouldn't have been complicated. Guys, guys, sorry, we're having the same problem as before, Elsa. Elsa, same problem as before. I'm going to have to end broadcast and start it again, okay? So, so please stand by, everyone. I'm going to send you a new link. Oh, no, we're live. We're live. Hi, everybody. I'm PJ Kwong for SGS Live. And in today's session, we're going to take a look at a story that shouldn't have been complicated. The story is about the chemistry that goes into making a certain product durable and safe. Well, I'm going to let our experts say its long name, but suffice it to say that on first blush, 6PPD seemed to be doing its job of protecting the integrity of the product in question. However, turns out there were negative effects happening to the coho salmon population of the Pacific Northwest that could be traced back to this chemical. This is a fascinating whodunit story that um, is, has SGS scientists at the forefront of this contaminant sleuthing. There is lots to uncover here, and I am joined by Dr. Bharat Chandramuli, who is the product director of SGS North America. Bharat, thank you for joining me. Hi, PJ. How are you doing today? I am great. It's so great to see you. you We're also going to be joined by Dr. William, Dr. Million Woodney, who is a senior product development scientist for SGS. Welcome, Million. Thanks for having me, PJ. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Okay, let's get right to it. Bharat, you and I know each other from a few of these SGS lives, but other people maybe don't. Can you tell me a little bit about what fills your days? For sure. Yeah, we do. We've done these before. Uh, the one line answer is that I help our clients better measure contaminants in the ecosystem and in people. Uh, my title is I'm the product, product director for the SGS Environmental Lab Network in North America. So in that sense, I'm in charge of bringing on new products and services to our clients. I've been working on emerging contaminants for what it seems like decades now. So I've learned a lot about emerging contaminants along the way. So basically, not busy at all. <laughs> <laughs> Million, I'm going to ask you the same question, please. Yeah, I am a product development scientist at SJ Success, and I have been doing this for over 15 years and have developed several proprietary methods uh, at SJS. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to kick things off with a little bit of trivia. At the beginning, in my intro, I was referring to 6PPD. So I guess I would like my audience to weigh in on where they think it comes from. Uh, so Million and Bharat, you guys can't play in this. I just want you to know, I know, because you probably know the answer. Uh, but for our audience out there, do you think that 6PPD comes from cows, garbage, Cars. So that's our trivia question. Where does 6PPD come from? Cows, garbage, or cars? I want you to put your answers in the chat and we're going to review a couple of them. But let me come back to you, Barad and Million. What do you think the audience is going to say? Oh, hard to know. Um, yeah. Tough question if you don't know. I will always say garbage, right? Because a lot of we have a lot of challenges with waste in our ecosystem and waste streams. So you know, if I didn't know anything, that's what I would guess, or something from our waste streams. Do you know what? I would have guessed cows, because back when I was a kid, cows were our friends, you know, milk, drinking all kinds of milk. And then it turned yeah. out that cows, you know, with that whole methane gas thing, that they were um, rascals in their own right. So that's probably where I would have guessed. If you knew nothing, Million, where would you have guessed? Uh, probably guess the waste stream. <laughs> Do you know what? Chris says, cars. Tony says A. Uh, what's the A stand for again? Anyway, cars from uh, 
Muthji and all kinds of people are weighing in. Uh, another LinkedIn user says cars. So lots of people think cars. Well, you know what? If I weren't doing this SGS Live, I wouldn't have known where it comes from. So Barrett, I'm going to say to you, uh, can you tell us what is 6PPD and why is it causing so much mischief? It's a very interesting story, and the story for many of us in the environmental community starts where the rubber meets the road. So there's your answer. Our car tires keep us moving safely. But there's a lot of chemistry that goes into making the making them durable and safe. So the ozone in the atmosphere, for example, can do a number on the tires as it's very reactive. So the tires need protection from, from, from the ozone. The catchily named N13-dimethylbutyl, N-phenyl-P, phenylene-diamine, or as we affectionately call it, 6-PPD, is one of the most common anti-ozonants used in uh, car tires. Its job is to slowly react to the ozone in the atmosphere instead of the rubber, so the tire material is protected and you can drive safely. So most of the 6-PPD turns into a well-known reaction product that, uh, you know, it is safe, uh, been well studied. So we thought, you know, no problems here. So far, so good. But, you know, there's another intersection here. For many of us in the Pacific Northwest, where Million and I live, we've known for a while that our wild salmon um, runs are nowhere as healthy as they used to be. Salmon populations have dropped to less than a sixth of what they used to be even 50 years back. And this is a focus of attention for the government, people involved in the fishing industry, many scientists, and many of us who live here. There's many, many hypotheses for these uh, for this on ongoing decline. Climate change, habitat loss, pollution, disease all come into play. But one specific concern, especially uh, locally here, is uh, is the mortality of juvenile salmon in our urban and suburban streams. It's called urban uh, stream syndrome, and we've known for decades now that one species of salmon, the coho, has been dying in our uh, more urbanized watersheds, and it's seasonal too, affected by runoff from stormwater and other factors. Um, as you know, salmon hatch in streams and rivers, and the coho salmon, for example, spends at least one winter in the rivers and streams before heading off to the ocean to mature. So what happens in these streams makes a big difference to their life. For years, researchers have been trying to understand what have, what's been going on here and why these uh, juvenile coho salmon have been dying. So uh, definitely a mystery. So I yeah. guess I'd like to know, how was this problem uncovered and um, how did the quinone enter the picture? How these stories uh, connect is the story you know, the subject of this episode of CSI Environmental. Uh, researchers at oh, the oh, University and of Washington and many other places have been studying this issue for a while now and, and, and have definitely identified road runoff as a potential cause. And more specifically, tire wear particles. So that's particles coming off our tires. But no smoking guns were found. So they started looking into this further. And when they did the toxicity test with the runoff, surely, uh, they found toxicity like many other researchers before them. But, you know, here is the problem. While we have these sophisticated instruments, mass spectrometers, that can potentially detect thousands of chemicals, many of them unknown, the mixture here is still too complex for researchers to find that, you know, well-hidden tiny needle in this big haystack. So take that analogy further, they really need to start trimming and hacking away at that mm -hmm. haystack first. So Million and I were talking about this the other day over lunch and such, such interesting chemistry at play. So Million, do you want to tell us more? Yeah, sure. So what they did was they used uh, chromatographic separation so that the complex toxic mixture is separated into fractions that contain smaller components. So what they used was they applied this toxic mixture on this chromatographic column. And then as the components were separated, they were collecting fractions and they were doing two things to them. One, analyze it for toxicity. Two, analyze it on high-risk uh, mass spectrometry for the number of components in that fraction. And when they find that fraction that is toxic, they will take it again and apply it to a different column, uh, again, fractionating it and testing, it, uh, testing each fraction for toxicity until they were finally able to find a fraction that has only four features, or if you like, components, and that was still toxic. And when they looked at the chromatogram for this uh, final fraction, they were able to see this one peak corresponding to a molecule containing 18 carbon, uh, 22 hydrogen, two nitrogens, and two oxygen. When they dried this extract, they were able to see this 
a magenta pink precipitate. It is a previously unknown compound. And there you have it, Barat, you're smoking. And when you think about it, this compound uh, is similar. This compound, which is now called 6-PPD quinone, is similar in structure to the 6-PPD, but with two oxygens sticking at the opposite side of the molecule, but making all the difference in toxicity to the cohosalmon. Wow. You know, uh, Bharat, I guess I want to know, why is so much attention being paid to this contaminant? One word, toxicity. When the researchers tallied their toxicity measurements for this substance, they initially got to around 800 parts per million as the LC50 concentration, which means that is a concentration that will kill 50% of the organisms that is ex that is exposed to this chemical. So 800 parts per million, a part per million is like one drop in a swimming pool there. Uh, so that is very toxic, but that was not the end at all. There's more. To do these experiments, the researchers had to make some guesses on the actual measurement and the purity of the 6-PPD quinone because it was all completely unknown. They didn't know how pure it was. While they, while they were able to get a better chemical standard synthesized and then a more accurate measurement, the reported toxicity increased eight times. Now it is 95 parts per trillion. So that is unprecedented for an unknown substance. So, and you, you, you see that table out there, the researchers in the study compared the acute toxicity that you don't remember, that is 50% mortality uh, uh, for the coho salmon to a number of other notorious chemicals. Just take a look at that table there for a, for a second. Um, it, it, is, it is quite amazing. Um, 6-PPD is in second place there. Almost every other substance on this list is a pesticide designed to be toxic to their target pest. This 6-PPD quinone is an accidental contaminant that no one knew anything about till 2020. It is second on the list, and it is constantly forming from a substance that is added to tires and percentage levels. So one to 2% of a tire may contain 6-PPD. So it's a large, large problem and toxicity. Toxicity is the is the word we're looking at today, that's for sure. I just know that our audience is super interested in this topic, and we're going to take a quick look at who's joined us, because uh, we have always viewers from all around the world. So, Saad Hashmi, thank you for joining us from Pakistan and from Afghanistan. We have um, somebody from Paraguay, thank you for joining us, and from Colombia, um, and from Ghana. We have guests who come into these SGS Lives from all over the world. Welcome to one and all. And if you're just joining us, we are joined by STS Live experts, Dr. Bharat Chandramuli and Dr. Millian Woodne, and we are talking about 6-PPD and its effect on the coho salmon of the Pacific Northwest. Check out our QR code if you're looking for more information or you want to get taken to our landing page. Uh, that will be on the screen right to the right-hand side. But let's get back to our conversation. Bharat, how important are salmon to the Pacific, Mor Nor Pacific Northwest, and why should I care? Well, Million and I live in Victoria in the heart of the Pacific Northwest, and our lab has been here since the early 70s. Our wild salmon are what are known as a keystone species. The Native and First Nations who have been here for thousands of years define themselves as salmon people. As an abundant food source, salmon has sustained people and animals here for the longest time. Our critically endangered southern resident orca population, for example, only eats salmon. I mean, talk about specialized diet, right? That is how much the ecosystem has been shaped by wild salmon. Even as they spawn and die, their remains are a big nutrient source for our trees. They say big salmon make big trees. That's it is exactly true. They are irreplaceable here, which is why this issue hits hard locally for us. You know, we've been talking about how SGFs um, was involved in the fight to uncover 6-PPD quinone. So how are they helping? Yeah, and if you sat in on our LinkedIn Lives with me before, um, you'll know that we love helping people measuring, em, measure emerging contaminants at these very low parts per million uh, trillion levels that are needed. I mean, as, as we have a large lab network, but an integral lab part of this network is the SGS Access Center of Excellence, located on Vancouver Island, where I live, up in Pacific Northwest, salmon country. What we do best at SGS Access since the 70s is 
develop and validate measurement methods for contaminants like these. As soon as we saw the research from the University of Washington, you know, Millie and I started talking, we started looking at for all the supplies needed to be able to measure this in our lab. And remember, this measurement is really important. Remember that correction in toxicity by a factor of eight? That's what happens when you don't have the right standards, materials, and measurement methods. And so for as a lab whose accuracy is relied upon across North America, this is important to us to get this right. So once we had the right standards, a million was able to develop a method using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry that can measure 6 ppd down to 0.8 parts per trillion. You know, that's less than that one drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool of water. We, we do this kind of sub part per trillion measurement routinely. So we kind of take it for granted, but it is no mean feat to get down that low. <laughs> for real. I mean, I wouldn't take this for granted. That is for sure. So millions, seriously, how do you go about finding one drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool? Well, uh, we use several techniques that are collectively known as targeted mass spectrometry. What it involves is we extract this contaminants and concentrate the extract by a factor of say 500 to 1000 or even more depending on how low the required detection limits are. Then we use a technique that's known as column chromatography. Basically what we do is we pass this extract that the concentrated extracts through a column containing an adsorbent and we selectively retain the compound while potential interference pass through the column. And then we come back and elute the compound and leaving behind some more potential interferences on the column. And then once we have the cleaned extract, we inject that into our liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry system where the analytes are separated in time through the liquid chromatographic system and then they enter into the mass spectrometry where, get, where they get separated by mass. Uh, to be precise, mass and charge. Once they are separated by mass, the components are selected and fragmented and we make the instrument to look for the fragment that we know comes from our target compound, in this case, 6-PPD quinone. Now, to make this process uh, generate highly accurate results, we use a technique that's known as isotope dilution quantification. Isotope dilution quantification produces the highest quality data in quantitative analysis. It is, if you like, the gold standard in quantitative measurement. And what it involves is it involves adding a substance that's similar in structure or identical in chemical properties to the compound to our target compound to the sample that we are analyzing. So in this case, we add a 6 ppd that's with the exception that five of the hydrogens are replaced with heavier isotopes of uh, hydrogen, deuterium. And this is added to the sample. And because it is chemically and structurally similar to our target compound, it tracks our compound through the extraction, cleanup, and analytical uh, stages uh, compensating for any slight losses along the way. So when you put all this together, we get a very sensitive, accurate, and reproducible measurement for 6-PPD quinone that the researchers and government policymakers can use to make decisions on these watersheds. So, Million, I'm going to stay with you for the moment. I want to know specifically about the rubber additive 6-PPD. Are we tracking it? And if so, how? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you think about it, the new compound, which is a 6-PPD quinone, might be difficult to analyze. But once we get the right materials, the standards and reagents, we were able to quickly develop a method that went down to that parts per trillion level Brad was talking about. But we also know that researchers have indicated that only 10% of the parent 6-PPD gets converted into 6-PPD quinone. So if you're just measuring 6-PPD quinone, 
you might be uh, potentially only looking at the tip of the iceberg. So we wanted our clients that were coming to us for 6-PPD quinone to have at least an idea of the concentration of 6-PPD so that they know the potential of their sample to generate more 6-PPD quinone. However, when we started working with the samples, the 6-PPD was quickly disappearing from our samples, uh, uh, basically uh, losing it through the system. And we talked to other researchers involved in this, and they had similar experience. So what we did was we spent some time researching ways to establish this analyte through the system, and we used different uh, reducing agents in the aqueous and uh, the solvent mediums, uh, 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 and also using uh, restricted light in our lab, we were able to recover, you know, from zero, we were able to improve the recovery to 30 and 40%. So it's, it's been quite a an evolving and challenging process, but we are at least able to provide a lower bound estimate of six PPD concentration and it's not perfect, but it's information that we believe is useful to the researchers. You know, this is fascinating. And if you're just joining us, I am here with SGS Live experts, Dr. Bharat Chandramuli and Dr. Millian Woodne. And we are talking about a worrying contaminant used in treating rubber tires known as 6-PPD quinone. Don't forget, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this interview session. If you have a question, feel free to leave it in our chat. But for right now, it's back to our discussion. Also, make sure you check out our QR code if you want more information or to be taken to our land page where you can sort be in touch with our team. So, um, Barrett, let's talk about stormwater for, for a moment. Um, what else is in the stormwater? Is there anything uh, from your perspective about where SGS comes in? Yeah, stormwater systems catch all the rainwater and runoffs from our roads, homes, lawns, and more. And as we urbanize more and more, there's just so many more impervious surfaces that cannot filter and remove contaminants. So even before 6-PPD quinone became such an emerging concern, stormwater has been widely studied. So from the hydrocarbons of the road surface to oil and fuel spills, to pesticides from lawns, to microplastics from plastic debris, tires and brakes, there's so many contaminants to deal with in stormwater. And another area of concern that we've definitely discussed in the SGS lives past is uh, and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. That is a concern in stormwater too. And that's just what we do best is we measure contaminants of all kinds. And we've been helping our clients measure pollutants in stormwater for a long time. In the United States, uh, many stormwater discharges are regulated using the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES. Our labs support this regulation routinely to keeping these uh, the stormwater systems safe. On the emerging contaminant front, where you know Melin and I were talking are talking about 6PPD quinone today, we're constantly helping people understand what other contaminants are present. Do they have the potential to create harm, cause harm? Uh, what is their fate, what their transport looks like? It is really important work, uh, keeps us busy and fulfilled. So what are people trying to do about this problem? I mean, how are they trying to solve it? Three things, uh, reduce, uh, replace, and mitigate. Um, it is an old truism that fits really well for 6-PPD quinone. So on the reducing front, reducing tire and road wear particles is hard, right, given how integral driving is to our way of life. But tire manufacturers and other uh, uh, industry people are working on a number of fronts here, from uh, better materials to smoother roads. Uh, from an individual impact perspective, three things, uh, drive less, uh, drive smoothly, and keep your tires inflated. Um, on the replacement front, there is a big push from governments and tire manufacturers alike to greatly accelerate the search for alternatives to 6PPD in tires. And the state of California, state of Washington, have been taking a number of uh, important regulatory steps recently. But this is a difficult challenge because you have to balance the safety and durability of the tires with the toxicity and alternatives. And these alternatives takes time to get tested and approved. But the good news is that everyone is on board, including the US Tire Manufacturers Association, um, and collaborating to find solution. Um, on the third front, mitigate. Uh, there's been a lot of work over, over decades on best management practices for stormwater. 
Um, so we have this great base to build from. Bioretention or biofiltration, uh, for example, is one good mitigation solution. Essentially, you have an area between the road and the stormwater drain or stream that has enough sand, compost, and plants and other features to slow that flow of runoff and filter it before it reaches the streams and the rest of the ecosystem. So you've seen these rain gardens uh, popping up in urban areas, for example. These are a simplified version of a bioretention uh, system. The goal really is to stop the pollutants from hitting the streams. So, and this works. Uh, before we knew about 6-PPD quinone, uh, researchers reported in 2015 that urban runoff that was toxic previously, but that had run through a bioretention zone, prevented all mortality in juvenile salmon. So, you know, you have a system that works. The big challenge with this is scale, right? There's thousands and thousands of miles of road surface. So, you know, it's scale. You start with the most vulnerable spots and build from there is how people are approaching that. So if I wanted to take us back to the beginning of the story, uh, how did SGS come to be involved? I mean, what kind of clients are looking for this kind of work? Yeah, I mean, many, many of them on emerging contaminants before they're regulated, we need to learn a lot about them. Occurrence, fate, transport, toxicity. And this is where we get involved first. Uh, governments and researchers work with us to make some of the first measurements to understand PPD quinone. Uh, for example, we work with people trying to understand the threats to whales in Canada, I mean, in other places as well. What part does 6-PPD quinone play? Uh, it is hard to know what you can measure, and that is where we help initially. But, and then once we move along and once a contaminant gets regulated, we have this large lab network that helps industries, governments, and everyone else with the measurements needed to conform with regulation to ensure that the regulations that are designed to, uh, you know, to handle these contaminants are actually working and keeping us safe. Again, we measure. Measuring is where it's at, that's for sure. Uh, we're gonna have time for one more question before we get to our Q&A. And if you have a question for us, please feel free to drop it in the chat. If you're just joining us, I am with Dr. Bharat Chandramuli and Dr. Millian Woodney. We are talking about a worrying contaminant known as 6-PPD quinone and its effect on coho salmon in the Pacific Northwest. If you want more information, you can also scan our QR code, uh, which will take you to our landing page and more information. So persistent and emerging contaminants are clearly a well-documented documented problem. Um, from your perspective, is there any reason for optimism or hope in this situation with the salmon? Well, PJ, I happen to be an optimistic person myself, so this will, this will inform that. Our salmon face so many threats from climate change to habitat destruction, unsustainable fishing, disease, contaminants as well. There's a massive challenge but they are a keystone species. So we know everyone wants to solve this problem and we have to, we don't have a choice. So, the, and there's consensus. That is the good part. And the one that I wanna focus on is people work to fix this multidimensional threat. So for example, we do a lot of work locally uh, to restore urban streams and watersheds to the point that we now have salmon spawning in areas where there have been no salmon for decades. And that is the one area, for example, I've done volunteer work on before. At SGS, we want to contribute to the solution in all the ways we are able to as a company. So by helping our clients get the data they need, you know, backing back to measuring contaminants accurately, but we do more. We do product testing they, that, that is needed in order to design safer products. So much more. So in, in a lot of ways, my optimism, as I mentioned, is informed by action and contributing where you can to solve this uh, multidimensional set. So we're going to go to our Q&A now, and we've had some great uh, questions come in from our audience. Our first one is from Erin Saguna, who wants to know, does this problem only affect the Pacific Northwest or are other seas or oceans also involved? Oh, that's a great question. Um, 6 ppd quinone's toxicity is, is so interesting because it is very species specific. So extremely toxic to coho salmon. Not, not at all toxic to a, you know, some other species of salmon that are closely related. But in doing these tests with other uh, fish, for example, uh, researchers have recently discovered that rainbow trout and brook trout, for example, which are much more widely distributed across North America, uh, are also affected fairly significantly by 6 pd quinone. So in the last few months, what we've learned is that this uh, problem has been 
is, is gone from a Pacific Northwest problem to something that can potentially affect a lot of other species. But the key here is it is very specific. So unless people do the tests, we will not know. So that is what researchers are working on right now is to you know, frantically understand what else is these uh, uh, 6PPD quinone is toxic to. This is a question that may be for Million. Um, how many separations and column cleanups were needed per fish tissue extract? And that's from Leroy Huber. Uh, well, so far we are analyzing this in water. Uh, and in water, we only require one silica gel uh, column cleanup. Uh, we are planning to do tissues in the future. But so far, we haven't done tissue. But uh, the tissue may require more column cleanup. All right, gentlemen, I have a question I think that's going to be for both of you. Um, what's next for SGS um, on the antioxidants and ozonins measurement front now that you've got six PPD quinone figured out? Uh, are there any others that you're sort of keeping your eye on? Bharat, if you'd like to sort of start, and Million, if you could please jump in. Yeah, I mean, as as you know, I mean, we're busy working, looking into other antiozonants and antioxidants that are out there, many of them. But not just that, uh, we are, you know, we're working on a number of fronts on emerging contaminants with PFAS are a major issue. And we're constantly looking at new PFAS, constantly looking at new threats like chlorinated paraffin. So, you know, um, we, you know, we're busy, but, you know, Millions the one doing the work. So I'm going to let him <laughs> expand on this. Yeah, yeah. You know, 6-PPD is just one of many antiozonants that's in current use. And by the same token, 6-PPD quinone is just one reaction product. In addition, antiozonants are not the only oxidation control substances that are added to tire or rubber. There are other oxidation reaction, oxidation reactions that are initiated by light, where light protectants are added into rubber. So we're working on to develop a more comprehensive method covering anti-ozonants, antioxidants, and light protectants. So uh, it will, we hope it will be very comprehensive. Okay, so you you two are definitely keeping your eyes on all kinds of stuff. And Million, I'm going to ask you a very quick question. You alluded to a new method you're working on. When might that be ready? Yeah, well, this is not written in stone, but we anticipate the method to be ready around March 2023. And so I hope sooner close. than that too. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we shall see. Fingers crossed. All I can say is that thank you so much to Dr. Bara Chandramuli and Dr. Million Woodne for talking to us about their uh, CSI or coho salmon investigation. See what I did there? They are contaminant sleuths and <laughs> I know it's good, right? Um, thank you so much for joining us today. PPD Queenon, 6 PPD Queenon has been the subject of our conversation and the coho salmon of the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking about this again. Great talking to you. Great talking to you too, Peter. And we're so glad that you joined us today for this fascinating and engaging conversation. If you want more information, make sure you scan that QR, that QR code here on the screen. You can visit our website at sgs.com. I'm PJ Kwong for SGS Live. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now.